Isaiah 49. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, He named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of His hand. He hid me. He made me a polished arrow in His quiver. He hid me away. And He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I'm honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Isaiah begins this chapter with this bold claim that God knew him and chose him and named him before he was born. In a sense, he's giving his credentials because he wants people to listen to what he has to say. You can hear it in verse 1, the way he begins this chapter. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, He named me. He wants people to listen, to pay attention. He believes God is speaking through him a word for the people, and He wants them to know that He's got some cloud here, that He's been with God, and God has been with Him a long time, and He's ready to proclaim this word. And yet by verse 4... After verse 1, claiming that, verse 2 and 3, telling us about how God has worked and shaped him, he says, but I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. He goes from a bold claim to saying, I don't think this is worth anything. He is discouraged and disillusioned, it sounds like. Could that really happen? Someone feels the call of God and it grabs them by the heart? Then they lose it? I reflected on my own journey some. How while I was a freshman in college, it really began before that, but it clarified itself when I was a freshman in college that God was calling me into the Methodist ministry. I'd grown up in the Methodist church. So I'll go back home to talk to my pastor that was the senior pastor there at the time. He begins to tell me about this book you have to read and this process you go through. I need to meet with the staff parish relations committee. They have to assess my gifts and graces for ministry. They are the ones who determine whether I'm recommended to go on. Of course, I've known these people all my life. They are the ones who raised me in the faith. It was easy to talk with them. They sent me on to the district committee, then the conference committee. You go through all these different layers and stages. I finished college. I went on to seminary. I was ordained a deacon in my second year. That's the way we did it then as as a way to moving toward a full elder or someone who can serve an itinerate for the Methodist church wherever the bishop might send you. I breezed through all that. It was fine. I was coming into my third year of seminary. I thought I'm ready to serve a church. I had been a youth pastor and an education director and a number of things by then in a whole variety of churches, big and small. The district superintendent said, I've got a place for you. I was going to school in Kansas City, Missouri at the time. He says, I've got three churches, a little over an hour north of where you are. Be an easy drive, drive up there, preach three times on Sunday morning, visit people on Sunday afternoon, go back to school. So I said, okay, I was excited. I drove up, I would preach 
8 o'clock, 9.30, 11, every Sunday, visit some people in the afternoon, go back to school. By February, I thought, it's going pretty well. I know these folks pretty well. They trust me. I was studying ethics and theology. We'd been talking about sort of the existential crisis that the nuclear weapons had created in our world and how possibly... If our country and the USSR kept escalating, one of these was going to go off and then a nuclear war and we'd all be obliterated. I thought maybe we should talk about it at the board meeting. (laughs) So in February, I brought it up. Guess how that went? I had farmers and homemakers and older retired businessmen there. They weren't too keen on the idea. But it wasn't that they attacked me. They began to say things to each other that I could not believe I was hearing in the church. It was like things I would not say to anybody. Well, at least not to their face in a church board meeting. (laughs) But they were saying things. They were not of one mind. It just escalated in unhealthy ways after one and another of them spoke until finally the conversation just stopped. We had some other items of business, some, by then, what seemed like rather mundane decisions to make about the building. We tried to talk about those, but the unhealthy negativity had grasped everyone in the room, and we couldn't even make a decision about anything. The meeting ended, and everybody left pretty much without speaking. I got in my car to drive back to Kansas City. I was disillusioned. Here were leaders of the church, people who had gone to church with one another for decades, and they spoke to each other in such harsh ways. I was stunned. By the time I got back to our one-bedroom apartment, Mary was there. We had been married just a little more than six months. She had not gone with me that weekend. I walked in and declared to her, I think I'm done. I'm quitting seminary, and I'm leaving the ministry. I added something like, I refuse to spend my time with people who are so petty and mean-spirited. She was also a student. I was the only source of income. She's like, wait a minute. (laughs) She had a little cooler perspective. She had not been infected by all the negativity that had surrounded me. She thought perhaps... Now was not the best time to make that decision for the rest of our lives. She counseled that I talk to some of my fellow seminarians and some of my professors and see if maybe I could figure this out in another way. Of course, she was right. So I navigated, finished the year, finished seminary, finished serving those churches. But I tell you, on that night, I could have joined Isaiah without a doubt and said, you know what? I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength, my strength for nothing. It was so disheartening to see people in the church, leaders in the church, treat each other in such terrible ways. So it can happen. I managed to stay in the ministry, but some of my classmates did not. We see people leave the ministry every year for one reason or another. But it's not only ministers. Research shows us that people who make a commitment to Christ, who join a church with great enthusiasm, who are on fire for God, if you track them for a year, more than 50% of them are no longer able to be found in their church. They have fallen away or drifted away or decided they made a mistake or something, and they are gone. Humans can be pretty volatile and fickle. We can lose heart quickly. We can become disillusioned and discouraged and disheartened in any numbers of ways. It happened to Isaiah. It's happened to me. Perhaps it's happened to you. Then this passage from Isaiah takes a surprising turn. After he sounds like he's about ready to drop out, like he needs some relief or maybe release from his call, just the opposite happens. Did you hear that in verse 6? 
This is now God speaking back to Isaiah, saying, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant or raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God doesn't release Isaiah because he's troubled or discouraged. God enlarges the call. No relief, not even a reprimand, but a greater call. In the face of Isaiah's discouragement, God doesn't say, oh, all right, take a break, go away. Oh, no, God says, I have even more for you to do. It doesn't seem like a great idea to me to put the guy who's disillusioned and discouraged and burned out in charge of drawing people to God. But that's exactly what the passage says. The clues in verse 7 in terms of Isaiah's turning around. Isaiah records, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred, the slave of rulers. God says, kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. That's the key to this. The key to this is the one who is doing the calling, not the one who is called. It's because Isaiah sees that God is the Redeemer, the Holy One, the one transcendent that's calling him that he can respond even when he's discouraged and disillusioned. I was reading in a devotional book, the one I'm using for this year a few days ago, the woman writing, it's writing what she felt like God said to her. Let me read to you just a few lines of what she wrote one day. Be calm, no matter what may befall you. Rest in me. Be patient, and let patience have her perfect work. Never think things overwhelming. How can you be overwhelmed when I am with you? That really grabbed me. I still have days sometimes that I feel overwhelmed. It's happened time to time throughout my ministry. But I thought how wonderful this reminder is, this question. How can you be overwhelmed When I am with you, when the Holy One, the God of the universe, is with you, rest in me, God says. Count on me. So it's not the circumstances. It's not who I am. It is who God is that makes the biggest difference. And Isaiah says God is the Redeemer, the Holy One, the one who is faithful, the one who can see beyond the bounds of life and death and knows us before and after. That one, the creator of the universe, that one is calling you. And there's power and understanding who's doing the calling. Isaiah can go on in the face of discouragement and feelings of failure because God is calling. And Isaiah says, you can count on it. God is faithful. The Gospels tell us the same thing. We see in the Gospels, Jesus expands that theologically to say that God not only called the prophets, but God is calling all of us. Each and every one of us has a call. If you read through the Gospels, you can see it in all of them. If you look at Mark, as he tells us about Jesus beginning his ministry, it's not just calling individuals disciples. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. It has come near. Repent and believe the Gospel. Or in John, where he says, I have come that they, not just a few individuals, but anyone who will listen, that they may have life and have it abundantly or the largest portion of any preaching that jesus does in the gospels in matthew for example the sermon on the mount jesus talks about these blessings that different groups different individuals have i'm going to read you a few of those verses 
when Jesus saw the crowds, He went up to the mountain, and after He sat down, His disciples came to Him. Then He began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Jesus isn't saying we all have the same call, but he is inviting all to hear the call you hear it again i'll just give you one more example later in matthew chapter 11 jesus talking to the crowds and says come to me all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens and i will give you rest take my yoke you could say my call take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Nowhere does it say we all have the same calling, but there is verse after verse within our Holy Scripture that says all of us have a calling. We might have different gifts and different blessings as Jesus enumerated in the Sermon on the Mount. But we all, each and every one of us, have a call from God upon our lives. We are called to be a part of the work of God for good in the world. And you could hear it in that last passage I read. Not only does God say, through Jesus, you are called, come and take my yoke upon you, but he gives us the assurance that if we will, God will carry that with us. He says, if you take the yoke, you can learn from me to be humble and gentle, and you can learn to rest in God. See, there is a power in God. Isaiah can respond and live out his call, not because of who he is, but because of the power of God he senses. Jesus is saying the same thing. There is a power of God that if you take on this yoke of which I speak, you'll be taught. And you'll be empowered. You'll have a sense of rest and refreshment for your souls in responding to your call. Now, Jesus doesn't always say it will be easy. But the power of God makes us able to not only do the work, but as Jesus says also, to rejoice and be glad that there's a refreshment and a joy that comes with walking with the Lord. Isaiah tells us all about his call throughout this book we're reading from. Today, he gives us a glimpse of his discouragement. And that he also gives us the clue to how and why he can continue despite whatever circumstances he might encounter. And it's because of the one who called him, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the one who is always faithful. It's interesting to learn about Isaiah's call and to watch as he grows in his faith and does the work of God. But perhaps more important for our purposes today, not to think about Isaiah's call, but to think about our own call. If, in fact, you believe the gospel that all of us have a call on our lives, then discerning your calling is really important. Where do you see yourself in God's work of bringing light and salvation to our part of the world? It's a question worth considering. May God be with you. Amen.